I looked into the charity shop window on that fateful day, and when I saw its plastic eyes staring back at me, it was like a lightning bolt. The grey furred plush bunny sat there, head lolling very slightly to the side, and when ear flopped down like a picture out of a Victorian children's book, it even still had the original tag on its ear. It had obviously been very carefully positioned to invoke such feelings, because it had worked. It was like a spell had been placed on me and I had to have it. Not for myself, you understand, but I had an instant compulsion to bring it home to my two-year-old daughter, Emily. It had been part of something called the Teddy Club, or the Teddy Bear Club, or something like that. Whatever it had been called, it had been someone's attempt at taking on the Beanie Baby craze and appropriating a slice of that money. It had gone about as well as you'd expect, and the whole club flopped pretty quickly, leaving the remaining stock worthless and almost unsellable for collectors. It was a shame, because they were really quite cute. A lot of attention had obviously been put into the design of them, and had they waited until after the craze had died down, they might have done well. There was originally going to be dozens of them, based on so many animals, but they'd crashed after producing only two different bears and the bunny, so collecting them was entirely pointless. I went into the shop and bought it, smiling at the thought of how much Emily would love it as they carefully placed it into a carrier bag, almost as if they were taking care not to hurt it. I thanked them and left, making my way straight back home. You're back early, my wife Denise said as I eagerly pushed my way through the front door. Couldn't wait, I said, finding her in the kitchen, scrubbing Emily's favourite red striped shirt in the sink. It was machine washable, but for some reason she refused to take the risk. Mother's love, I guess. Look what I found, I said as I reached into the bag and lifted the bunny's head, turning it as if it was examining its new surroundings. That's so cute, she chuckled. For Emily? Of course not for Emily, I said mockingly. Can you not see the tag? This is an original, um... I looked down and checked the tag. Teddy Bear Club Bunny Buns. She'd never appreciate its lack of value. So it had been the Teddy Bear Club after all, I guess. She'll love it, Denise said, ignoring my joke. Mum just took her to the park. She'll be back in about an hour. Oh, I moaned. I'd really been eager to give it to her. Wait, your mother's sober this time, right? The response to my question was a wet sponge thrown at my face. All right, all right, no need to get angry because you couldn't tell, I said as I retreated to the living room. The wait was almost unbearable and I actually had to stop myself from heading to the park to give Emily the stuffed toy there. I almost felt guilty leaving it in the plastic carrier bag, like it was something I wouldn't do to my own child, so why the hell was I doing it to this poor bunny? It was early evening when the door opened and in walked my wonderful mother-in-law, Emily cradled in her arms, obviously tired from her outing. I walked over to greet them both with a kiss on the cheek. Hi, Helen, how was she? I asked, looking into the droopy eyes of the light of my life. Oh, you know, once the meth had worn off, she was fine. A little tuckered out, though, she said as she carefully handed over the precious cargo. She asked if you were sober, came a traitorous call from the living room. I looked back at Helen with a nervous smile, her stern eyes glaring into my own. Well, mostly sober, she finally said with a chuckle as her look softened. Hey, pup, I said, turning my attention to Emily as I took her through to the living room. You're looking shattered. I think it might be time for tea and then bed for you. I sat down on the sofa, the carrier bag and its contents calling out to me from the floor at its end. But first, there's someone I'd like you to meet. I propped her up on my knee with one hand and reached for the bag with the other. I lifted the grey head out as I had done before and placed its eyes firmly gazing into Emily's. A huge smile spread across her face through her tiredness and she reached out for the stuffed animal. Now be careful with him, I said, drawing it out completely and bringing it close to her. He's quite old. She grasped onto him and gently hugged him in the overly tender way only toddlers can when they've been told to be careful with something. She was grinning broadly and cooing soothingly to the bunny as if she was trying to calm him down after being dragged from his old home to a new one. That evening is one I play over and over through my head, thinking of how I could have done things differently, burning that Damn rabbit at the stake would have been a good start. As I put her into bed, I placed it into her arms and kissed her gently on the forehead before heading downstairs to spend a quiet evening with Denise. And by quiet, of course, I mean the 30 minutes we'd get, if we were lucky, before Emily woke up wanting a glass of water or another bedtime story or whatever ruse she'd come up with to avoid sleep for a few more minutes. Sure enough, it was around a half an hour later when the baby monitor we still used with her crackled into life. This was no begging for mummy or daddy to come and tuck her in again, or or even crying because she'd had an accident, though. No, this was the shrill, high-pitched wailing of a child in pain. Denise and I both looked at each other before running upstairs into her room, slamming a hand into the light switch, flooding the brightly coloured room with a harsh glow. My heart was racing as we ran in and tried to discover what was going on. In my mind, all the worst possible scenarios had been running through like a freight train carrying the purest darkness a mind could be filled with. I pictured finding her on the floor with a leg twisted and dislocated as she fell out of bed. I imagined finding her with a dozen stinging and biting bugs clinging to her delicate skin. In my mind I even saw her with some small, dark, razor-toothed demon raking at her flesh with its claws. 
Nothing could have prepared me for what had actually happened. She was sitting up in bed, looking untouched at first, except for the watery eyes and running nose of a pained child, until, on closer inspection, Denise noticed a spot of blood on the sleeve of her pyjamas. It was probably no bigger than a penny, but it looked huge against her tiny frame. She scooped up the child gently and ran through to the bathroom to inspect her. I was about to follow when, by sheer chance, my eyes glanced across a similar blood spot on the white fur of the rabbit's belly. I seethed. Had some broken glass or shard of metal got into the toy during manufacture, I swore I would sue the makers, the sellers, and even the charity shop if anything happened to my precious little girl. Dear God, to this day, I wish that was all it had been. I grabbed it by the arm and stamped my way over to the dresser, placing that thing on top and raked at its fur, my rage overcoming any previous liking I'd held for it. A ripping sound filled the air, seeming appropriate when matched by the crying from down the hall as the stitches parted and fabric shredded. I tore its belly open and pulled out handfuls of stuffing, not caring about my own safety, just wanting to find out what had hurt my baby. My heart almost stopped when I found it, my breath only coming in shaking gasps as I tried to comprehend what I was seeing. Denise came back into the room, carrying Emily, whom she'd finally managed to calm somewhat. She'd been saying something, probably about finding nothing serious, but not a single word got through. I presume she put her back to bed because when she came over to me, her hands were empty, one placed on my shaking shoulder. Her screams finally pierced my catatonia when she saw in my hand the needle from a syringe and the crumpled note that read in a spider-scratch handwriting, Welcome to the club. And that was The Teddy Bear Club, written by me as a uh, one-day challenge which included the writing and recording of the story. Uh, I wanted to basically challenge myself a bit, and I just thought, you know, can I do this in one day? Well, the writing itself and the recording, I got done in one day. The rest of it, as usual, took a while. When I set myself the challenge, it had to be from concept. I couldn't just pick a concept that I already had and just start from there. So one of the first things that occurred to me was the whole welcome to the club urban legend where needles were left on seats. This actually even featured in one of my local newspapers when it allegedly happened in a local cinema, though, again, it was just second-hand evidence all the way through. And I just tried to think, you know, what could make this even more horrific? And that led me onto the whole needle in the stuffed animal given to a child. I tried to lead away from the ending a bit by, you know, hinting that it may have been another haunted doll type story rather than the physical horrific attack story. Uh, before you get concerned, luckily this sort of thing has never really been substantiated, and apparently the actual chances of getting infected like this are minimal. Um, I'm still working on putting emotional engagement in, but I think I'm getting closer. You know, basically, tell me what you think in the comments. You know, Did you like it? Where could it be improved? What did you think of the concept? Do you think I took it in a decent direction to make it a scary story? Just basically see what you've got to say. Uh, don't forget to like if you liked it comment with anything you have to say and subscribe for more. I do uh, readings every Saturday. I also do gaming videos and general videos in between where I think something might be funny. Until next time everybody, keep being beautiful to each other.